Well, we turn this evening to our fourth study in the Gospel according to John. It's not John's Gospel, it's Christ's Gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. In our second study, we considered the uh, testimony of John the Baptist, whose, if we could summarise his faithful preaching in one word, it would be, repent, repent of your sins. And he uh, was called a Baptist because he baptised people uh, to, for the forgiveness of their sins. Last week we thought of the word believe and receive. Two words, uh, both speaking of how it is that we come by faith and take hold of Christ. And so we're not to believe in ourselves or in our good works or in our religious activity, but we're to believe entirely in the Lord Jesus Christ. So repentance and faith. Believe on the Lord Jesus and you shall receive the right to become the children of God. Receive him as your king and he will reign in your life. We come this evening to verse 14 of the chapter and uh, the question that it seeks to answer, who is this Jesus that we are to receive? Now in the opening verses of this book we read, in the beginning was the Word and the Word was with God and the Word was God and he created all things. So we think in those early verses that the Lord Jesus Christ is the creator. He is God, the Son. And so we've already learned something about the person of Christ. But here we are coming to think of him as a human being when he came into this world. As the creator, we see that he is a personal being. God is not equated to the four fundamental forces of nature. If you have studied any physics, you will know about the strong nuclear force that holds an atom together. Those protons would surely... Uh, being opposite charges, push apart, and the atom could not exist. But the strong nuclear force holds them together. So the fact that there is matter is because of that force. And then there is the weak nuclear force, which enables the stars to shine. And then there is the electromagnetic force, and it's right proportion that gives you all the chemistry that there is necessary for life. And of course, the fourth and the weakest of all the forces is gravity which holds the universe together and causes our planet to orbit the sun. Well, of course, these are the great forces of nature, the, the laws of nature that God has put into place. And there were such people, and the reason I mention this, because you may have known a, a certain deist, who believes that there is a God who created the world and created order, but do not know him in a personal way, and do not feel that you can really know him. Of course, I'm speaking of the famous Sir Isaac Newton. Sir Isaac Newton was not a born-again Christian. He did not have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, yet he believed in God. He believed that God made the world and he established his laws. In fact, his great desire in the life of Isaac Newton was to know about God, what he is like. And he spent more time studying theology and seeking to know God than he did actually doing any science. Not a, a, a well-known fact, but it's true. The idea here is that we can know about God through the creation, 
that he is powerful and wise, for example, but it's another thing to know God in a personal way. And when we come to the Lord Jesus Christ, he introduces us very closely to knowing God in a personal way. This is what this text that we have before us is about. Uh, we can know God personally. Of course, God is a personal being. We are made in his image. We are made in the image of God. And we are not just forces. We are not just those electromagnetic forces which uh, chemistry, uh, as I said earlier, operates under. But um, we are made in his image. So we are made to know God in a personal way. Now this is revolutionary. So we're not talking about the deism, we're talking about uh, the Bible and its revelation. We can know God in a personal way. Um, sometimes people describe God as their father. It's an interesting concept because the father, uh, particularly to the child, is greater than the son. Uh, he has more knowledge and uh, greater strength and more experience of life. And so I'm thinking of a young child. Uh, rather than a grown-up child. But there, there is a relationship, isn't there, between the father and his children. We are in his image. You might, as a child, look a little bit like your father. Certain personality and, and, and physical traits might be seen in your life. The father is greater, and yet he is knowable. And, of course, if you... Uh, come to know your father and you have a relationship with him it's a wonderful thing and this is a, a picture of how it is that we can know about God but also know God of course God is described in the word of God uh, as a loving God now I don't think the gravity or the strong nuclear force can have any capacity to love. They are inanimate forces. But God is described as a loving and a compassionate God. So he's the one who created us, but he's full of compassion for his creatures. And so you are one of his creatures, and God has a love for you and a compassion for your soul, which is why he sent the Lord Jesus Christ to come into this world to be your saviour. So what John is doing here, as he introduces the person and work of Christ, he is introducing us to God. We can come to know God in a personal way and have a personal relationship with him through the Lord Jesus Christ. So the Christian faith, as I say, is much superior and more fulfilling and vital than the faith of someone like Isaac Newton. In verse 17 of the passage that we have before us, we read that about the Lord Jesus Christ. The law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. He is full of grace and truth. It says that here again in verse 14, that he, um, we beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. This is a wonderful thought, isn't it? That the word who became flesh and blood was full of grace and truth. It's just the beginnings of getting to know who the real Jesus is. So he became flesh and blood. So he was fully God, equal, co-equal with his Father, creating the world, as we had thought. But he also became, as we say here, the Word became flesh. He also 
became fully human. And this is unique about the Lord Jesus, the real Jesus. He is fully God and fully man in the same person. God and man in the same one person. Two natures, one person. Of course, we know that Jesus as God would have been, as his father, a spirit. We're told in chapter 4 and verse 24 that uh, God is spirit. Um, God is spirit and those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. So God is spirit. He doesn't have a body like you and I. He doesn't grow old like you and I do. He doesn't have these um, emotional life that takes over like sometimes we have. So God doesn't have, uh, as it were, bad days when he's angry and other days where he's loving. He is perfect in all his characteristics and all his personality. So God is not like man in, in many ways. He is spirit. God is not human like you and I. He is God. We are made in his image. We don't make God in our image. But because we are made in the image of God, he is, as we see, a personal God. So we have here a spirit, a person who is loving and kind. And of course, a God who has a mind. God uh, we have been given reasonable minds. We thought about this a little bit this morning. God has given us reason. Uh, I don't think an ant, which is a very complex creature, has a mind which can reason. It, it responds to chemical stimuli. It does certain things because of, uh, of a reaction, a chemical reaction that's the, the, uh, or should I say a biochemical reaction and he, and he acts by instinct and, and of course you might think that an ant is very industrious and very clever but although it has a brain and a nervous system it doesn't have a, the capacity to reason and even if you think of the higher animals such as a dog well a dog um, has a, a larger brain and it does act certain things under instinct again. But it doesn't think about whether there is a God, or how can I be saved, or is there a heaven and hell. It doesn't plan years ahead uh, and think what it would like to do in its life. You see, a, a dog, again, it has a brain, and it ha but it doesn't have a reasonable, it's not a reasonable soul. So we are unique as human beings because made in the image of God we have a reasonable mind and we would say that life we're talking about life on a human level um, is characterized most beautifully in the relationships that we have with others this is all part of being made in the image of God and understanding who Jesus is we have relationships with other people one of the most important relationships you will have is with your wife or your husband. You are joined together uh, in marriage and you are a companion for life, faithful to one another, supporting one another, uh, the husband of course being the head and the wife being submissive to the husband, complementing and supporting uh, him. And as a they bring up a family together. So the relationship you have with your husband or wife is a very personal relationship and it's very exclusive. And then of course you have children. And if the Lord blesses you with children, uh, you will know of their individual personalities. It's a, it's a great t to see a second time around uh, my own grandchildren who have lived with me. We know that uh, uh, the uh, Jake and Jess's children were living with us for a, a period of about three years 
And then, of course, now we've had some of Reuben's children. And we've got to know them and their different personalities. And we come to know them and to love them because that's another important relationship. And then, of course, there are close friends that we have as well. And all of this is part of what it means to be a human. We're not just a cog in a machine. We're not just a case of we wake up in the morning, we have our breakfast and we do things in a mechanical way. We go to work, we clock in, we do our job, we clock off, we come home, we have our tea, we watch television, we go to bed. Now that is a kind of very uh, mechanistic view of life. And of course it's not in keeping with reality. The reality is we have relationships with people. And some of them are, are wonderful and some of them are not so wonderful. But we're made with relationships. Well, we're not made to know God in a personal way. We're to have a relationship with him, with the creator. Now, these are all wonderful things for us to discover in the gospel. That God has made us for a reason. He has set us apart from the animal kingdom for a reason. Not just to rule over it, but to know him and to love him. And to experience the love of God and the, the majesty of God and to know something of that. And we're created not just for the earth. This is something unique about humans. I didn't think of this until it came into my mind just now. But, you know, unlike all of the advanced animals, the, you can think of gorillas and dogs and horses or whatever you might think of as an intelligent animal, a dolphin. They're only made for this world. But we are created with an eternal dimension. We are created to know God in heaven or to be excluded from heaven, which is another thought. But, you know, we're, we're made with that eternal dimension to, to know God and to see God in eternity. No one has ever seen God, we're told, but God the Son has made, has declared him. This is what we find in this text. So we're made to know and to love God. In fact, the aim of the gospel, one of the great aims of the gospel, isn't just to have your sins forgiven and go to heaven. That, that is a, a great aim. That's why we preach the gospel. But the great aim of the gospel, the way it's described in the Bible, is to reconcile you as a sinner to God which does require the forgiveness of your sins we have the parables that Jesus spoke of the son who had a relationship with his father and it turned very sour and he packed his bags and left off to a far off country and then when he spent everything and was in great need he came to his senses and he thought about going back to his father this is wonderful picture of when he approaches uh, his father and, and his father runs towards him and embraces him and he's reconciled to his father that's what the gospel's about it's about you having that personal relationship with God so man is separated from God on account of his rebellion we see it in the prodigal son again on account of our sin in fact, all the religions in the world, and there are many, and possibly there are more people on planet Earth that are religious who are find, trying to find their way to God than, any, than those who are non-religious. But all the attempts are to go up to God. Our attempt to somehow reach up to God and be right with him and to find forgiveness and uh, salvation. But what's so wonderful about our text is it turns everything upside down. It's not about us reaching up to God, but about God himself coming down to us in the person of his son. The word who was God and with God became flesh and dwelt among us. He came from heaven into this world to be with us and took upon himself our human nature this is wonderful you don't you don't read of any of it, this kind of thing in this world he took upon himself our human nature he it says here and dwelt among us 
Now here is the amazing thought, that he who dwelt in heaven was going to dwell with us. He who was worshipped by the angels and sat upon that throne in heaven, left the glory of heaven and came down into this world and took upon himself our nature and dwelt among us. He made his dwelling among us. We know that he was called up to Nazareth, where his parents had come from. Uh, certainly his, his mother and, and Joseph had come from. And uh, it was a, a bit of a, a, a run-down town, village, uh, an ordinary village in many ways. I'm sure, well I say sure, I, I expect that when Jesus was a young boy, he, he, he joined in the recreational activities. Perhaps there was a little piece of grass or something with a, a goalpost and a ball. I don't know if they played football in the first century, but I don't see why not. And he would have joined in and uh, had great fun. He, he, he was among us. They would have known him. Oh yes, Jesus. He's quite, he's quite good on the left wing or whatever. And uh, a good goal scorer. Maybe he was a goalie. I don't know. He, he, just, he just lived an ordinary life like you and I in, in many ways. And, and, and he, in his education, he was trained up to be a carpenter. And Joseph was a carpenter. And he would have learnt the trade. And he would have learnt how to use a plane. And many other such things. And some of the skills of carpentry. And uh, people in Nazareth would have known about Jesus. Oh, yes. We know Jesus, Jesus the carpenter. That's how he would have been known as, Jesus the carpenter. A good worker, modest rates, does a good job. Yes, if we need a carpenter, we'd definitely call on Jesus. Because he dwelt among us. You see what the Bible's trying to say here? That it's got this wonderful contrast in this chapter. That the God who made the universe, who made the stars to shine... One who created DNA, the great designer, the great creator, is the one who came down, flesh and blood, like you and I, and lived among us in Nazareth. Of course, the, the focus, most of the focus on the New Testament is on his public ministry. But he had a uh, we know that he grew up as a carpenter and then became a uh, public preacher. It, one of the reasons we re read John chapter 2 is because, you know, it, the most natural thing to be invited to a wedding. It's a very happy occasion. A Jewish wedding would have gone on for a number of days. And uh, it was a great honour for Jesus and his disciples, as we uh, find out early, later on in chapter 1. Uh, they were all invited to this wedding, and something happened. The wine ran out halfway through the ceremonies, the celebrations. Well, what's, what's going to happen? Are we going to have to send everyone home early? Is it going to be the... It, it was, um, well tragic in many ways for the bride and groom and the parents and of course you know the embarrassment I'm sorry but we've got nothing more to serve you it's all gone we didn't have enough and uh, and so we're told that the the mother of Jesus came to him and told him that we have no wine and Jesus said to her woman what does your concern have to do with me my hour here it is in verse 4 my hour has not yet come. Very interesting words. Jesus was clearly aware that he had come for a purpose, not just to be a carpenter in Nazareth, but to be the saviour of the world. His hour had not yet come. He came for a reason. The reason Jesus came into this world was to save sinners like you and I. He came to save. He came on a mission. He came with a purpose to reconcile sinners to God. 
and to be their saviour. And he saves not through being a carpenter, but through preaching the gospel and revealing himself as the saviour. That was his great ministry. And so for three years he travelled through uh, those northern parts of Galilee and all the way down into Jerusalem. And we will notice how he had to go through Samaria in chapter 4. He, all these historical places. And he's revealing himself as he goes along as God's saviour, as the Messiah. And his great purpose, as he shares with his disciples, he had come that he might go to the cross and suffer at the hands of the leaders, that he might suffer on that cross and bear the sin of all his people. His hour here, we're told, is not yet come, but his hour would come, the time when he would go and fulfil that great ministry in being our saviour. Jesus came to die. We're born to live, but Jesus was born to die upon that cross at Calvary and be your saviour. So we can divide the life of Jesus with one part, the obscurity and the public life of Jesus. His public life had not yet come, but when it had come, we beheld his glory, we're told. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory. The glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. This glory is that he was God. Now, of course, we know that his heavenly glory was concealed. His heavenly glory was concealed. And yet through his words and through his miracles and through his declaration, he began to make more and more evident that he was truly the Son of God. We see it in the miracles he performed. The blind being given sight, the lame being able to walk, even those who were dead and buried in the tomb coming out and being raised to life. So yes, Jesus was, by all accounts, flesh and blood, but he was much more. Paul later, the Apostle Paul later goes on to write that God, 1 Timothy 3.16, God was manifested in the flesh. There it is. God in the flesh. Do you see how we're beginning to understand about the real Jesus? And why it is that you need him? He was full of grace and truth. What does that mean? What does that mean? Well, it means that he is one that you can trust your soul to. He's full of grace and truth. Grace, I'm not going to give you the precise theological definition, so don't hold me to this. It's, we, we would say that salvation is all of grace. All of grace. Right? Salvation is all of grace. And so grace it, are the riches of God that are to benefit our souls. This is something that he communicates to us. He doesn't communicate his glory to us but he communicates his grace to us it's what we stand most in need of as rebellious fallen sinners there we are fallen in sin far away from God what we need is to be reconciled to God we need the grace of God the riches of God that benefit the soul and that includes the forgiveness of all our sin that's what we stand in need of. We Only grace is able to, where sin abounds, Paul writes in the, to the Romans, where sin abounds, grace much more abounds. It superabounds. So the great antidote to sin is grace. And that's why Jesus is full of grace. He's able to forgive us. 
And of course, so it's that, and it's all the righteousness that you and I need for heaven. You cannot go to heaven without righteousness. He will give it to you. He's full of grace and truth. Of course, a contrast is made here with the law. The law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. You know, keeping the Ten Commandments cannot save you. That's how many people think Christianity is about. It's Judeo-Christian religion. It, they've got the Ten Commandments, the moral law of God. And people think wrongly, and it might be an uncovering of, of some ignorance on your part, that keeping the Ten Commandments can save me, you might think. But it can't. I was trying to think of an illustration that might suit. And I think, think of it this way, that the, the, the Ten Commandments, the moral law of God, the law that came through Moses, is like a sheet of thin glass. And you step upon it. One crack, one false move, and it shatters. The whole thing breaks. Or think of, you know, those lakes where you see um, a frozen lake and there's a sign. This is what the law of God is. You see a sign put on the side of a lake, danger, thin ice. And you need to get to the other side. How are you going to do it? As you tread most tenderly and care carefully, cautiously, trying to get to the other side. One wrong step and you hear the crack. And you fall and perish. So how do you get through to the other side? Well, this is where you need grace. And in my illustration, if the law is like that thin ice that you can't traverse across without perishing, you need something like a bridge to get across. And the thing about a bridge by my own simple reasoning, is you need one end to be on one side and the other end to be on the other side and to span across. Well, that's what the Lord Jesus is. He is both God and man in the same person. He touches both the, the manward side and the Godward side. He is both God and man and spans the whole um, lake as it were and so if we are willing we can cross that bridge for free it's just one way of thinking of the gospel so let me close with verse 18 no one has seen God at any time the only begotten who is in the bosom of the father he has declared him no we we cannot see God but through faith in Christ, if we have faith in Christ, we can know God. We, you know, we, uh, we speak about God who is known. If you see Christ, you have seen God by faith. Okay, you look at Christ... And by faith, recognising him as the Son of God, you have seen God. In fact, one time, I think it was Philip, said, show us the Father. You find it in John chapter 14, show us the Father. He says, how long have you known me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father. It, when we see him by faith, we know what God is like. So this is, the, this is the contrast. The world says God is out there somewhere. But here, with the Lord Jesus Christ, he stands before you full of grace. He offers you salvation full and free. It's here we see the deep love that he has with his Father. He's in the bosom of the Father. The Father has sent his Son to be your Saviour. Do you see how it all connects? Do you see what you need? You need, to, you need to come to Christ. You need to trust him. 
You need to have him be your saviour, to forgive all your sin. You need Christ to reconcile you to God and to pardon and wash away all your sin. You need the grace of God to save you from your sin. It's all found in Jesus Christ. The Father sent the Son to be the saviour of the world. He anointed him. That means what Christ, that's what Christ means, the anointed one. He anointed Christ to be the saviour. He appointed him to come into this world. And if you come to him, you will be saved. Well, this is a great gospel. We've learned much tonight about the person of Christ. And I hope that you will see that you cannot save yourself, but you need this very one who came into the world. He came with a purpose to save people like you and I from our sin. Do trust him. Do come to find out about him. Read him in the scriptures. Find that quiet place and ask him to be your personal saviour and reconcile you to God. Amen.